Hello and welcome to today's edition of the InfoSec Institute weekly video series. Uh, today we will be talking to Ron Gula about his time at Tenable Network Security, his career in security awareness, and his new project, Gula Tech Adventures. Ron Gula started his cybersecurity career as a network penetration tester for the NSA. At BBN, he developed network honeypots to lure hackers. He ran the U.S. Internetworking, uh, Internetworking's team of penetration testers and incident responders. As CTO of Network Security Wizards, Ron pioneered the art of network security monitoring and produced the Dragon Intrusion Detection System, which was recognized as a market leader by Gartner in 2001. As CEO and co-founder of Tenable Network Security, Ron led the company's rapid growth and product vision from 2002 through 2016. He helped them scale to more than 20,000 customers worldwide, raise $300 million in venture capital, and achieve revenues in excess of $100 million annually. Ron is the president at Gula Tech Adventures, which focuses on investing and adv ad advisement of cy cybersecurity companies. Ron was honored and humbled to receive the 2017 Beta Moore Beta Award to be named a 2016 Baltimore Tech 10 leader and a 2013 Maryland Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young. Ron Gula, thank you for being with us today. Hey, thank you very much. Great. So um, you started out uh, as a penetration tester for the NSA. Um, how has the cybersecurity landscape changed since you first got involved in the business? Well, the biggest thing that's changed is, is the technology. We're using the cloud today. We have IoT devices, self-driving cars, robots, drones, et cetera. Yeah. So in the late 90s, it was traditional IT, you know, servers, networks. We, we didn't even have, have wireless back then. Right. What hasn't changed is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Right? We learned those lessons really, really well. And every time we invent new technology, we seem to forget to apply those things. So um, what are some of the uh, smart security awareness strategies? I guess you sort of said that right now, but like what were some of the things that are sort of commonplace now, but it was impossible to get your clients to go along with back in, back when yeah, you Yeah, so it's no secret the NSA has a lot of people with clearances, you know, top secret clearances and higher. Right. And an, an objection that I often got when we did a penetration test was, hey, the person next to me, the person I trust has a top secret clearance. Why can't I share my password with them? And I thought this was a, you know, a really cool, cool thing back then. But obviously we had, you know, a lot of insiders and most recently we had reality winner. But what I was surprised about when I left that, that type of uh, customer and I went into banking and I went into education, people had the same excuse. I trust the person right next to me. Why do I have to have good, you know, cyber practices? So that hasn't changed at all. Right. So there's, there's uh, the sort of social engineering element of it where, uh, people just assume that they're going to be safe because, you know, they're smart and, you know, the person next to them is smart. They, they, they can't imagine anything going wrong if there's no. Well, security is hard. Pick any subcategory like encryption, authentication, intrusion detection, good network design. It's hard. If it's done well, it looks easy. But just because something looks easy and it's easy to use doesn't mean it's secure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, uh, so what are some of the security awareness strategies you learned while being a pen tester for the NSA? Uh, a lot of the things you probably covered, right? Social engineering is, a, is an easy thing. Uh, cyber hygiene is hard to do. Uh, breaking in and, and getting in is really a matter of effort and will and not a binary. You know, no, one's, no one has ever done enough that they couldn't stop somebody from getting in by spending enough, right? So those things haven't changed over the years. They just moved on to new technologies. Mm -hmm. And did these experiences sort of lead you to go into business for yourself or was that uh, other factors? So my, my job at the NSA was on the defensive side. So I wasn't one of these people hacking into the bad guys or the, the terrorists or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I was looking at, after the good guys. The NSA has a great practice of securing the president's communications all the way down to, you know, the DOD and different parts of the, of, of the government. So I got exposed to a lot of different government programs. Some of them was civilian government. And they really were, were pretty advanced types of uh, networks. So when I left sort of government service, I sort of had seen a lot of the biggest networks in the world, and that gave me a sense of scale, uh, such that when terms like big data came around, I was like, I, I think I've seen some, some bigger data than what people are calling big data here. <laughs> it gave me perspective. Right. And uh, that's one of the reasons I like to invest in companies where the technology or the founders have a certain sense of, of, of the size of the problem, and they've probably come out of the U.S. government. Hmm. So... Um 
you've you've seen information security obviously from many different perspectives now you've you know you've worked for the NSA uh, you've you know started your own company and now you've started a uh, sort of um, tech startup advocacy and, and you know financial assurance organization uh, what do you think in general about the current state of information security and do you think that security awareness is becoming more prominent on the IS landscape yeah there's a number of, of very interesting angles on that so from, as an investor you've probably read that, you know, there could be a bubble. There could be a certain sense of too much money rushing in. Mm. Um, and, and there's a lot of, there, you know, there's some, there's some people who could say that kind of stuff. But the reality is, is the problem is so broad and so deep. I think we're going to be working on cyber for a, for, for a very, very long time. Now, clearly from a technologist point of view, we haven't solved everything, right? We, we haven't solved authentication and intrusion detection. We, we can't even solve voter, you know, security. So, right. and it's not like people aren't trying. It's just the technology is moving so different fast. And so it's moving so fast. Your definition of security and my definition of security are a little bit different, which makes it difficult to, uh, to have one size fits all. Hmm. So um, you said that you, you, there's, there's fears that the money is rushing in too fast. What is, what is the issue there? Just that there's too many companies starting up too quickly without sort of proper coverage of the problem or? Well, as technology moves on, there's always new people solving confidentiality, integrity, and availability in these new forms. Uh, you see that right now most recently in the cloud. As people move their development and their web applications to the cloud, there's a whole new set of problems in, in that space. Who do you trust? Do you trust the cloud providers? There's some people who still do it sort of on-prem, so to speak. And that just adds a lot of complexity to that. Uh, another big opportunity for investing is just this shortage of smart people that we have. Uh, there's only so many cyber people. Um, I don't know if the number's a million or three million. They, they throw down a lot. But there's certainly, I know a lot of people who are looking for cyber you know, experts out there. And we're not going to be able to train all those people. So I'm a big fan of any type of cyber program that helps automate a process, makes it easy for a human to do the, their jobs better. So it really is kind of a learner's market right now, then it sounds like. Like there's, there's more, it's, it's more great. openings than there are people to, to fill them and so forth. It's, it's an opportunity for many, many, on many, many levels. If you're an organization and you haven't invested in, you know, good cyber hygiene, a good network design, and you're having people, staff, maybe it's a good time to think about, you know, your entire approach to IT and information management in general. Hmm. At the same time, if you're, you know, if you're reading this video, watching this video, and you're, you know, 18, you know, leaving high school, getting into college, and you're thinking, hey, I don't like programming, there's still like 20 or 30 other career fields you can do in cybersecurity and IT. So it's a great time for, for many people. Now you said something about um, possibly changing your entire sort of security uh, portfolio. Is that in regards to like current companies and stuff? Like what, what are you, what are some of your recommendations for sort of tightening up, you know, someone's security program or, or, or you know, based on what you know, um, you know, what, what are, what's, what are the, the wrong emphases and what can be done about them? Well, if, if you're a business owner or you're working at a small business yeah. and you're, you still have an email server, I actually still run into people who are doing that. You know, you're really missing out on the ability to embrace the cloud. It doesn't matter which vendor you choose, Google, Microsoft, other types of, of uh, providers. They all do a better job than you can do on your own. <laughs> And that's something I try to tell people to, to, to do. And that might mean not only moving your email to the cloud, but embracing things like, you know, Google Chromebooks, where, you know, the, the cost of managing those things is a lot different than managing a, a Microsoft desktop. And the attack surface is a lot smaller. That's a good example. Oh, do you think people are holding on to their, their old email servers and stuff just because that's the way they've always done it or because they sort of, they can see the tangible object there uh, and, and they're sort of not sure about the cloud because you can't really see it or what? what yeah, without what's having an entire conversation on SMB and outsourced IT, a lot of small offices outsource their IT to something called a, an IT service provider, a managed service provider, not necessarily a managed security service provider, but somebody whose job is just to make IT run really well. And the key to doing that is trying to do as much as you can with, with as few resources as possible. So a lot of times we do see people cutting uh, costs, maybe not doing the best job they could be doing that you might get in an enterprise network. And uh, we will see one way to save costs is to run your own email server and not, you know, pay whatever the, it, you know, Office 365 is charging this week. Now, it's not saying the entire industry is doing that. I'm saying that's an opportunity for improvement. Uh, if you're in cyber and you're watching this and you're going to the dentist office, mention it to your dentist. You know, hey, who's doing your service? Have you considered just, you know, 
trusting, you know, Google or Amazon to, to, to do it. Now, if we flip this conversation around and we talk about this from the enterprise point of view, it's almost completely different. People are still worried about a cloud lock-in. They want to have maybe because of GDPR, they want to bring back the data center and have much, much more control over their data. Maybe they want to have the control over that data because they're too experiencing uh, flaws from third-party risk. You know, any big company is probably doing business with hundreds, if not thousands of other partners. They need visibility into that. So things have become a lot more complex for large enterprise. That's, that's really interesting. You said, uh, you know, talk to your dentist about what they're doing. It's, I mean, it seems like we're really, you're really putting the onus on sort of everyone, you know, who's hearing this, like to, to sort of get the word out that, that, that this is, you know, something that all sorts of industries are behind on, whether it's healthcare or whether it's law enforcement or whatever. So uh, do you think that, that that's something people should be doing in general, just sort of like keeping abreast of, their sort of communities, cyber programs? It, it used to be if you were in cyber and you had an opinion, what you didn't want to do is get called over to your neighbor's house, you know, on the weekend because they had an antivirus or, you know, back in the 90s because their hard drive needed to be reformatted, right? So the industry, I guess, has improved in those things. I think a lot of times people just don't want to get too involved because I, cyber is a very personal thing. Where do you put your data? Where do you put your email? Who do you communicate? Where do you go on the internet? But the reality is, is that we're all intertwined. And if you have an opinion about something, I do think it's okay to ask and, uh, and, and suggest alternatives. Uh, so uh, uh, to go, going uh, back to, uh, you know, your old, uh, your old company, um, uh, Tenable Network uh, versus uh, Gula Tech Adventures, it seems like uh, you've, you know, now you're financially facilitating up and coming startups and providing the consulting work and stuff. Uh, versus being the actual security provider. So what caused this shift in your your thinking and your strategy? Do you feel like finances are the sort of primary setback or information or or, or what, what's holding small companies back these days? So it's really, I, I'm, I really enjoy cybersecurity. I enjoy the, the trade-offs you have to make from an engineering point of uh, view. I enjoy the different personalities that are out there innovating. And frankly, I got into it, sort not, not really sort of by accident, but I actually really ended up enjoying it. My last few years as, as CEO at uh, Tenable Network Security, I had done a couple investments, and we saw a couple exits where we got a really good return, um, but it gave me a lot more knowledge of the market, seeing who the acquirers were, seeing who the customers were, seeing who the founders were. Not only are these, you know, did we make lifelong friends and, 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 and contacts, but we like, hey, we really enjoy this space. And you know, I had a great experience with the investors at Tenable, you know, with Excel and, and, and Insight. And I saw a really lack on the seed side, the smaller side, people who invest maybe a million dollars, half a million, just, you know, get people going to their first million dollars in revenue. That's, I, I saw a really big gap there. So rather than starting just one more company, I really thought I wanted to meet as many people as possible and, you know, be involved both financially and, you know, directly with these companies. So you get so there. It sounds like there's an awful lot of sort of startup companies that have good ideas, but are sort of uh, being held back, you know, due to lack of uh, financial support or you know or what have you. It's very accurate. And as much as I like to say, hey, we've been fairly prolific. We've done you know more than two dozen investments. We probably said no to almost 500 companies. Hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of companies are five percent better than the current. Uh, solution. The, the CTO of Tenable, Renaud Darrison, he talks about that a lot where, you know, there might be a current market leader out there and maybe somebody's got a better way to build that mousetrap, but it's 5% better and you need to switch out the, that old mousetrap. That's hard to do. Um, the other cool thing is something that's really, really disruptive that nobody else is doing. You're going to look crazy for investing very early on until until it catches on. So I like living in that area where you know, in some cases, we are making technologies, you know, incrementally better. Uh, in other cases, we're really, really disrupting things. So there's also that sort of excitement of the this this could not work out, or this is like a big risk, or we're, you know, we're really trying something new and untested. A big thing is, you have all these new technologies, you have also have markets. So we talked about the SMB market, for example. You don't see a lot of endpoint competition in the SMB market. That's pretty much uh, antivirus endpoints. Mm -hmm. So companies that we look at in that space that can disrupt that market, which is primarily with cost savings, that's pretty cool. The trick is, is do they have a business model that can generate revenue and acquire customers and hopefully have an exit as for an investor? 
of, of the sort of 500 that you say no to on a regular basis, what are some of the, the main things that they're doing wrong for those of us who are, you know, possibly looking to talk to Google tech and there. Yeah. So there's, so there's a design pattern of, I sense something, um, you know, sniffing packets, uh, logs from the cloud, uh, wireless signals. And then I dump that and I do some sort of artificial intelligence and machine learning on that data. And then maybe I enrich it with perhaps threat data or other industry types of data to produce an, an, an output. That's the kind of solution that's really, really hard to sell to an enterprise who already has Palo Alto and Splunk and Q1 Radar and a whole bunch of endpoint products out there like Carbon Black or CrowdStrike or, 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 or even Tenable. So that's one type of product that I think is a hard, you know, that's, that's hard to get excited about. Um, anytime you have a market leader, you know, somebody like a, a, a CyberArk, a Splunk, um, you know, who's really entrenched out there and has a lot of customers who are using it, they might not be entirely happy with it, but they're, but they're, they're paying with it, they're using it. You know, that, that means you've got to replace that if you, if you get it in there. So, um, you know, products who said, hey, we can do a job better than somebody's, they, they better do a job more than 5% better than, than, uh, than those type of things. And, and, then, and uh, quickly too, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then the last thing is there's just a lot of technology that I just, I just don't believe in. You know, I'll get, I'll get pitch technology where uh, maybe we're going to disrupt uh, the identity market by embracing the home market and, and putting users in charge of their identity. Now, as a privacy advocate, I like that. But when I talk to CISOs and I, I say, hey, do you want your employees authenticating to something um, you know, in their, in an employee's or in a personal cloud or, or, oh no, we can, we have to be sovereign with our, so I, you try to test these things and there's technologies that I even like, and I like the people, but you know, I talk to customers and they say, we won't buy that. So it's a complex dance, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So going in the other direction to the, to the companies that you said yes to, uh, what is your process at Gula Tech Adventures for improving your client's business? Do you have like sort of a, a, a common thing that you, you work with them or does each one have its sort of its own case? So we do Google Attack right now. It's just me and my wife, and you know she was basically she was at the first company, the intrusion detection company, never Secret wizards. She ran that. Tenable. She did a lot of operational stuff. So between us, we've got like forty years of just you know working in cyber. So most of our companies, when they run into a problem, we can give them a lot of perspective. Uh, not only that, we can give them a lot of perspective in fifteen minutes. Right? We don't need to do a board meeting. We don't need to do a study or anything like that. We're not always right, but we're, we're, you know, we have a lot to offer in a very succinct point of, uh, point of view. And a lot of our companies are different levels. So if you look at something like a, a Threat Connect or a Flashpoint, uh, these companies are Series you know, B, Series C. They're very sophisticated. Um, you know, I get to talk to the, the management team there you know, uh, not, not every day, whereas other companies that, that are seed, it's very important that we talk to these people almost weekly, you know, run the product, test the product. And uh, so the level of feedback and interaction is really commensurate with where they're, you know, where they're at. And, uh, you know, but the best calls are the ones that come, you know, at, at dinner time in the evening where there's a problem, perhaps we lost a salesperson, perhaps we hired a salesperson, mm -hmm. perhaps the number one competitor in the market just got funded $50 million. Um, so it's nice to be able to give perspective to, to, to those kind of folks. Uh, I like to get people profitable as quickly as possible. And that means, working with customers. You know, the more you can work with a customer, the better the customers are going to tell you about the market. I can pontificate all days about what I think is, is, is going to happen. But as soon as you have paying customers, that's a much more important source of uh, not only way to fund your company, but to kind of guide what you're doing and validate what you're, you're doing. So what is the most common mistake that up and coming startups that you've worked with uh, are making? It's the fact that they want to do everything themselves. And I did this at Never Security Wizards. I felt like I was the, every decision had to be mine, every line of code had to be reviewed. It took me a really long time to even let other people kind of write signatures and write code in there. And I, I thought I learned a little bit of that when I went to, went to Tenable. I was still writing code, you know, from, from, from day one. But the biggest thing that you can do is to not just trust people. It's easy to trust people, but to make sure you're hiring and surrounding yourself with the right uh, you know, the, the, the right people. So, for example, at Tenable, I, the, the co-founders there, Jack Hopper, uh, Renaud Darris, and Tenable will not be where it was today uh, without some of those decisions that we had to make along, uh, along those ways. And then, um, of course, Tenable went public. There's a whole set of, uh, of senior managers in there that, uh, you know, we brought on to the company about three, four years ago that really kind of set it, it going. 
So it's not just a matter of scaling and trusting the people, it's hiring and selecting those right people. And then, of course, if you don't have the right person making, uh, you know, making that change, that's the biggest mistake I see founders make. Uh, they have too many co-founders. They try to do too much themselves. They don't have a vision of what the org chart's going to look like two years or three years from now, even what those people are doing. And uh, that's the biggest place we can, uh, I, I, I try to give perspective to, to the companies we're working with. Is that sort of a loyalty thing where like every, everyone had, you know, a little uh, hand in this. And so therefore everyone's got to be on the masthead. Yeah. And you can, you can manage that. So, right. you know, when you're a founder, uh, you have, you have sort of founder equity, you founder, founder cred, founder, whatever you want to call it. Um, but maybe that founder is really a CTO and three years from now, we're going to put a CEO in charge of that company. Um, maybe the, the founder really is a CEO, but his co-developer um, doesn't like people, doesn't have people skills, yet he coded the first you know, versions, two, three versions of that. Um, that's something that you need to address really, really early on. You don't want to be going out for an A round and having a venture capital firm meet your co-founder and realize that this person can't hold a conversation at, uh, at, at, at dinner. And none of our portfolio companies are like that, by the way. But of course. <laughs> they were some of the ones that we've invested or didn't invest in. So, sure. um, so that kind of soft people skills uh, is, is really important. Yeah, and, that, and that's been coming up in just about every video we've done so far is that, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to, you know, do the coding and do, it, do the incident response and the threat hunting and stuff, but you really have to know how to sort of explain it to your board or how to explain it to your clients and things like that. So people, the thing I've always asked people, anytime I've ever hired somebody, anytime I, I, I invest in a company, I have some really, really difficult question, which is what do you want? And, and sometimes knowing what people want and trying to somehow manage that with what everybody else's want, that's hard to do. We're all different. We're all made differently. We're all have different goals. We're all motivated by different things, but it's important to know that. And uh, that's, that's really important when you're starting out as a founder you have to extrapolate into four years, three years down the road. Um, InfoSec Institute, obviously, we are a, a, a security training company, and we give a, a certification training in a variety of topics. But we've also launched uh, Security IQ, which aims at uh, security awareness training for uh, people at all levels of the company. And I'm just wondering, what, uh, what do you see the role of security education versus security companies you know, providing solutions for their vendors. What's the, what's the balance between the two and where do you think uh, security education can fit into that? Yeah, so personally, I've never been a, uh, we need to train people. If, if we train people twice as much or three times, uh, from an awareness point of view, mm -hmm. uh, that somehow they're going to magically be twice as more secure, three times as more secure. So I like balancing training and awareness with actual engagement. You know, if somebody reports something, make them stand up at, and, and it's, and, you know, make them stand up and say, hey, you know, Sally over here in accounting had a phishing attack that perhaps got through, but she reported it to IT. And guess what? That saved the company half a million dollars. And, and so you need to, like, I, I really believe in rewarding people as well. Right. Positive um, reinforcement. I love, I love testing. You know, I mean, Tenable is all about auditing. Um, you know, pen testing is what I started with. It's another form of testing. I think you can bring that into security awareness training. So I'm a big fans of Fish Me, Know Before, Wanda. I love all that kind of stuff. And I think it's really good to, to know that you're being uh, audited. Um, it does take enterprises. All, all enterprise security is going to, you know, really go into privacy. But pretty much, you know, the more you can put in front of people, uh, the more you can do that. At the risk of giving away your product for free, can you give us some security awareness tips for new small businesses? So I think if you're a small business, you need to think about how your business is growing, where your data is, what your IT budget's going to be. If you're outsourcing things, there's probably things you could be asking for that you're not asking for. So you need to think about where your data is, who has it, and what the likelihood that you're going to be compromised with. If you're a small business, like I said, Google, Amazon, they are going to do a much better job protecting your email and your data than you can. Um, don't forget about physical security. You know, if, you're, if your data center and your office is only protected by a, a lock and key, then a lock and key is all it takes for somebody to come in. And never underestimate somebody hiring away one of your employees and taking some interesting data with you. Um, recently, InfoSec Institute instituted a set of four scholarships to facilitate the education of more women, minority, veteran, and college students in the study of security-related courses. Uh, and I know that Gula Tech Adventures is similarly committed to diversifying the security workplace. 
Uh, and I'd like to know what the barriers are uh, at this point to more women and minority hires in cybersecurity uh, and what you and your company are doing to combat this. Yeah, so, so personally, uh, so we're located in Maryland, close to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. uh, we become involved with a program called Year Up and another one called Empower, which targets uh, black minority. A lot, a lot of women are in this program, too. Mm -hmm. And it really tries to expose them, people who might not otherwise have ever heard of a SANS or your, your company or just right. done training online, uh, and basically puts a crash course through them to, to show them that. But what I really like about these programs Again, Baltimore focused, it, they do internships with T. Rowe Price, with Exelon, uh, with Under Armour. And that type of program where you can actually go from education to employment, I think is really, really good. Um, I'm also an advocate of startups. You know, again, in Maryland, Virginia, we have a lot of people who do services companies, and that's, that's great. I think a product company is a great way to employ a very diverse group of people, not just cyber experts, but also accountants and lawyers and salespeople and and facilities people and uh and that's that's a really big thing as uh, as well um a good bit of our companies have uh, uh there's a lot of women involved in them uh for example we just invested in a company called inky uh both the head of sales and the head of marketing are, are are female i come from a star trek universe i'm very libertarian so i tend to see a lot of diversity by default mm -hmm. um but uh so i'm big fans of that and then lastly i just i mean the best way to get more women and minorities, in my opinion, is to start young. It's, it's great to hire experience. It's hard to learn, you know, 20 years of cyber expertise if you've only got two or three and you're kind of retraining. You need to be open to that. But the best way, I think, to really, uh, you know, fulfill that is to really start at the high school level. So we've been doing a lot of that as well. Um, how about for companies who may see the issue but haven't figured out a solution in their own organization to create a, a more diverse workspace like you know they they, they I, I just kind of keep hiring the same sort of people you know like what are what are some strategies you can do to sort of uh break break out of that so a couple couple strategies first of all you gotta be aware of it so you should discuss it you should discuss um with your with your team with your board with your investors if you think you have a consideration there um you know, you really have an opportunity. You don't, you don't really have a problem. There's a lot of great places to, uh, to, to, to go. Um, the hard part is this. If you're, if you're a, a bank, for example, and you've got, you know, five openings on your SOC floor, you know, you want to have diversity involved. You want to be able to go and recruit. But a lot of times you're having a hard time, you know, finding anybody. So, you know, you try to have to reach out to other places you might not normally be going. So maybe change your recruiters. Uh, may work with you guys, may work with other online, you know, training places where you can, you know, sort of segment them, uh, by, uh, by race, by age, by state, you know, different things like that. But the, the most important thing, just gotta be aware of it. If you're aware of it and you care, you're, you're going to figure out, and again, what works for banking might be different than education might be different than a startup. But the, the very important thing is just to be aware and conscious of that when you're interviewing these people. And have you heard sort of case studies? I, I, you've probably, you've probably brought some more, you know, women and minorities into companies. Have you heard any sort of reports of how it sort of like improves or changes the, the, the work culture or the tech culture or, or anything like that? I tend to think that if you're building a culture mm -hmm. and you care about your culture, then you're going to be the best measurement of your, your own culture. I, I have a hard time with, uh, you know, I, th I find the studies are somewhat biased. Right. Um, if your culture, if you want to build a great culture and it's diverse and it's got a lot of uh, different complexities to it, I think you're going to be stronger uh, from those things. Uh, so I always like to tell people, look at their peers. If you emulate somebody who's really good, like if you look at a lot of uh, boards from Fortune you know, 200, Fortune 2000 type companies, you're going to see a lot of diversity. You're going to see a lot of different makeups. Um, but the question is, is, you know, how did they get there and why did they get there? And that's, that's, that's important. I completely agree. Uh, now, as looking to the future, as cybersecurity and security awareness become standard operating procedure for most industries, what are the big challenges you see uh, sort of looming that need to be addressed or will need to be addressed as the sort of tech changes, as, you know, the, 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 threat, the threats increase and so forth? Again, depending on where you are in the industry, if you're a small business, if you're a home user, or you're working in corporate IT, you're going to see some tremendous changes over the next couple of years. Corporate IT, large enterprise, it's going to become a lot more compliance driven. And, and that's, that's not a bad thing. 
um, it, it, it goes, does give people a goal that they should obtain, but being compliant doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that you're secure. It's where it's a minimum thing. That's a classic debate that's, that's out there. Um, and when you move out of the enterprise business, though, and you move into SMB and, and, and home business, you know, there's no way we can keep up. So you're going to see security more and more be hidden from us. You know, if there's a security update in a, in a phone, if there's a security update in your DVD player, uh, your, your TV, it's going to be automated. It's going to be sort of out of sight. And I'm a big fan of science fiction, right? So if you read, um, you know, Diamond Silicon, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, I just flubbed uh, Neil Stephenson's book, Diamond Age. Um, if you read that, if you read Ready Player One, if you read, you know, Neuromancer, if you read these things about science fiction about the future, that's really where we're going. Um, which means we are going to have a good bit of security, but we're going to have very little privacy. And the things that we're giving our data to both corporate and advertisers, it's going to be really difficult to figure out who has what um, and who knows what about us. I mean, all, all you have to do is read, uh, NPR had an article a week or two ago about ultrasonic tracking where apps on your phone are constantly admitting or listening a little bit to, the, to your microphone and if you walk into a store, there's a certain tone that we can't hear, but they're tracking you that there's in that store. And there's so many other nefarious and law enforcement and intelligence, you know, applications for it. It's, it's definitely interesting. So how do we stay ahead of these security challenges? So I think there's a, there's a couple ways. I think, first of all, we have to understand that I'm going to get deep on you here for a second. Please. That this security in general, it's really a collaboration between who, people who make it, the people who use it, and the governments who who regulate it. So we have to fight for democracy. Um, you do not have security when you go to a non-democratic country. And we have to realize that. So we're not just competing with China and Russia for you know, people overseas in Africa and Southeast Asia and Europe. We're really competing for how we want to govern ourselves as a, as a society. Um, so be involved with your politicians. Be involved at the local level. You know, know who's running. Know, know what those things are. It's really, really important. Um, and it's going to be much more important uh, as we go forward. Second thing is you can't sort of not have an excuse. I mean, I'm sure there were farmers and, and, and uh, people who didn't adopt the automotive when it first came out. And, you know, it's kind of irrelevant now, but the Internet and the technology and what happens to our data is moving so fast. It's our responsibility not only to educate the youth, but to also educate the previous generations to make sure they understand and that they are not being uh, taken advantage of, uh, you know, the right ways. Um, you know, teaching ethics, teaching those kind of things. So, and again, it's all, it's all interrelated. But then the last one's personal responsibility. We need to understand that there are people out there right now who don't go to the cloud. They don't go to Facebook. They don't have a smartphone because they don't trust anything. Now, they might be the Luddites, but they might also be, that might be the way things are going. If we have one or two breaches of a major, you know, one of the of one of the fangs, you know, Facebook, Amazon, uh, you know, Netflix, Google, whatever, that could be a, a very disruptive type of uh, type of thing. So we need to watch those kind of things. And on that note, I think we will wrap up uh, this week's episode. Uh, thank you all for listening and watching. You can find more of these videos on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in InfoSec Institute. That's I N F O S E C. Uh, and you'll find our page and lots more videos uh, like our video here with Ron Gula. If you'd rather have us in your ear during the workday, all of our videos are also available as podcasts. Just search for CyberSpeak with InfoSec Institute on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to read more about security awareness topics, please visit resources.infosecinstitute.com for thousands of articles, labs, videos, and more. And please check out securityiq.infosecinstitute.com uh, for our fish sim fishing simulator. You can uh, do fake fishing on your friends and colleagues, uh, as well as AwareEd, which uh, provides you with some security awareness training. So thank you again, Ron Gula, and thank you all for watching and listening, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.